from the Gospel of John, the scripture I was telling Stephen about, and uh, talking about the proof of God's love today. So before we go to the scripture, join me in a prayer to the Holy Spirit to enlighten the word for us. Let us pray. Spirit of God, we ask that you make these not just words on a page or a PowerPoint, but life to us. Feed us with these words, encourage us, and show us who you are and who you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our reading is from John 20, and it begins with the verse 19, and this takes place on the afternoon or the early evening of Easter Day. Listen for God's word. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you to God for continuing Easter season for us for 50 days or a week of weeks. So that's 49, 7 times 7, plus 1, Easter. And this is the Easter season. Back when I was 16 years old, I started getting stomach aches. They turned into being really bad stomach aches. So bad that I had to stay home from school, and I would be up in my room and wouldn't come out, and I wouldn't come down to dinner. And my parents said to me, what's wrong? I said, I have terrible pain in my stomach. And they said, it's not so bad. Come on downstairs. And they would come back, and they would come and go. Sometimes they would be extremely severe, and sometimes they wouldn't be there at all. And my parents kept saying, stop whining. Eat. Quit complaining. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just a stomach ache. It's gas. Well, it turned out I had gallstones at age 16. And I had gallbladder surgery at age 16. And the bad part was that it was, you know, some pain and annoying. But the great part was everyone paid attention to me. I got to stay home from school, I think it was like four weeks, and do my work at home. And a lot of people came by to visit and sent cards, and I didn't have to do any chores. But if you get gallbladder surgery around, okay, how old, 1971. Thank you, Chuck. 
1971, it isn't like gallbladder surgery now. So I ended up with a long scar, it's about that long. It's not very pretty. And I was really, really worried because soon it would be summer and there'd be bathing suits and then I wouldn't, maybe my boyfriend wouldn't like me anymore, et cetera, et cetera. My mother said, don't worry, the scar's gonna be fine, everything's gonna be fine. So sometimes I think that if, if I died and I was resurrected, kind of a weird thing to think about, maybe Chuck would say, I wanna see the scar. I'll know it's Sandra, even if she doesn't really look like herself, like Jesus never seemed to when he was resurrected. But I'll know it's her if that scar is there, that big, long, I think, ugly scar. Today, Thomas wanted to see the scar. Jesus, when he was crucified, got nails in his hands. And you may remember that in the Gospel of John, it says that a soldier put a spear into his side and to make sure, I guess, that he was all the way dead and that blood and water came out. And so Thomas said, I won't believe unless I see those scars. And so today, I want us to think about there's something about those wounds. There's something about those scars. When Jesus came in, he showed the disciples on his own. When Thomas wasn't there, Thomas said, I'll only believe if he comes back and shows me those scars. This series that we're going to be in for the time of Easter, for the 50 days, is called the proof of God's love. The scars seem to be for Thomas the proof that he was looking for. It says in Romans 5, 8, the proof of God's love is that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And you might say that substitute, the proof of God's love is that while we were mean, while we were stubborn, while we were total mess-ups, while we had no idea what to do, Jesus died for us. Jesus gave us life. And so for these next few weeks, I hope that this series will help bring us even to a stronger foundation on that belief that the proof of God's love is Jesus and that through Jesus we have life. As John said at the end of his book, we have life. So let's go back to the story, and then I want to tell you a story of my own. Remember that on Easter morning, according to the Gospel of John, Mary Magdalene saw Jesus and went and told the disciples, but they didn't really believe her. So they're behind closed doors, and the doors are locked. And I think it's very reasonable to think that when it says the disciples were behind closed doors, it's not just the remaining 11 disciples, but that it's many disciples of Jesus behind the doors then at that time, including the women disciples. So when Jesus comes and he steps through a locked door without opening it, a fact that amazed our preschoolers in chapel, in this, in chapel this morning so much, Aaron can testify they were amazed that Jesus can go. That's the thing they took away. They'll probably tell their kids, their parents at home, Jesus can go through locked doors. That's what they learn. So he, but he went through and he says to them, who are probably scared, sad, wondering, afraid of persecution, afraid of what life would be like without him, probably every negative emotion that you can imagine. And he treats them all with this word, peace. Shalom. They had betrayed him. They had run away from it all. For a normal person that would hurt you so much, you'd probably be mad and hold a grudge for a long time. But Jesus came in and said, peace, and he showed them his hands and his side without them asking. He showed them his hands 
and his side where the scars were, where the wounds were, and probably very fresh. Thomas wasn't there, so I've always liked Thomas. Thomas is sort of one of my heroes. I think Thomas had gone to get them something to eat when they were up there in the locked room complaining and crying and whining. Thomas said, I've got to get out of here. (laughs) I've got to get out of here. I'll go get y'all something to eat. But Thomas missed Jesus. And when he came back, maybe with his bag of food, and they said, the Lord has risen, we've seen him, he definitely was not buying it. Would you? These are people who are his friends, Thomas's friends. These are people he's traveled with. These are people he's had to trust. But he doesn't believe them because it's unbelievable. And so he says, unless I see the hands and the side, I am not buying it. He's calling his friends liars. Another week goes by. Now, I personally think feeling doubt and unbelief and not feeling trust in God is a very painful thing, and I've been there. I kind of imagine and wonder about the pain that Thomas was feeling. All his friends are saying, we've seen this. He's saying, I'm not buying it. What was that like for him? When Jesus comes back, he comes back for the disciples, but he mainly comes back for Thomas. He comes back, he comes back through a closed door. John makes a big deal of that. And he says, peace, shalom. He says to Thomas, come look at my hands. Come touch my side. It's okay, come and see. Notice that John doesn't say whether he actually touches or not. I'm thinking maybe he didn't. He says, my Lord and my God, the most powerful, clearest affirmation of Jesus' lordship as being God anywhere in the Gospels. My Lord and my God. I know that all the disciples over the next days and weeks, as there were more appearances of Jesus, not that many more, but more, and as the spirit that was breathed on them worked through them, became more confident and more assured, not only that Jesus was risen, but that that was proof of God's love for them and for the world, and that sent them out to be bold, bold apostles. I told you I would tell you a story, and it's about my own doubt. It's about my own lack of faith and trust. It didn't start early on. I was born in a German Lutheran family. I don't know if anyone else is familiar with German Lutherans, but they're pretty serious and um, no nonsense. I had, in my grandfather's um, generation, eight Lutheran ministers in that generation as uncles. That tells you how serious they were. I was baptized at home by my minister, actually at my grandma's house. My grandparents helped found the church. At that time, if I wanted proof, proof about God, I just took it from the adults. Have any of you had adults in your life when you were growing up that if they said, you know, there was a flood and Noah had an ark in it, you would absolutely be there. And so I believed the testimony of the adults I loved. Of course, I had the Holy Spirit, um, I believe, is given to all Christians. And I had a youth group, which I adored. I was confirmed, and I made my affirmation of faith very sincerely and tearfully. When I graduated from high school and went to college, I went to a Baptist college, Stetson, and um, that was in the day where it was very, uh, there were a lot of rules. For example, boys could go out and girls had to stay in the dorm unless you signed out. 
and signed back in and came in by a certain time. Um, lots and lots of rules. I tried going to the church down the street, but within uh, about a year, my faith had gone dormant. Has that happened to anyone? You don't have to raise your hand. In your life, where your faith just kind of went dormant? It's not like it's not true, but you're not really spending too much time thinking about it. By law school, and this has nothing to do with going to law school, it just has to do with age, um, that dormant faith was kind of going, continuing in the direction of unbelief. And by the time Chuck and I got married, we were married by uh, a minister that someone knew. Um, but within a year or so of that, I had pretty much decided there might not be a God, might not be a God. So what drove me in that direction was the thing that drives a lot of people in that direction, and that is to look at the suffering in the world that God doesn't stop. So I, um, I remember around that time, around 1980, um, maybe you remember there were four Catholic missionaries who were brutally murdered in El Salvador. Anybody remember that? Um, John Lennon was gunned down in New York. Of course, I don't, that wasn't a big... Uh, thing in me losing my faith. Um, but there were a lot of bad things going on in the world. There still are. There's people you know who lose people. There's people, um, very, very good people that very, very bad things happen to. And that was taking me to, um, I'm not sure there's a God because if there is one, I'm going to be pretty mad at him. Um, responsible adults in my life, like Chuck, did not lose their faith. Um, I have a best friend who's very um, strong in her church, and it's a church where, interestingly, there's a sign that says God is love right up front, which is a great, um, great words to see up front in the church. But no matter how much Chuck believed, it doesn't matter how much someone you know believes or, or love or is like your person, it doesn't necessarily transfer to you if you're an adult, like it does when you're a child. So what happened? I had locked doors, shut, locked. Unbelief is very, very painful, I think. That's why I think Thomas was probably in some real pain during that time. So you go kind of between pain and not caring. Those are really your only two options. Well, Jesus came through the door for me, but it wasn't really like all at once. Ta-da! It was like this. Um, some people at work at my law firm, now and then we'd talk religion. But one time I went on a trip with one of the senior partners and we went and uh, that was back in the day where you could take a chartered little airplane to your hearing and it was over in Pensacola and come back. And we went over, went to our hearing, made our arguments to the judge and we were flying back. And that's when I learned for the first time that this very senior partner was a wounded person, not had, didn't have a scar on his belly or in his hands, but it had some terrible things happen, and he was a wounded person. I thought he was like perfect, great lawyer, amazing person. He had problems with um, physical problems. He had problems in his family. And for the very first time I learned, he was a Episcopalian, a Christian, who told me that he believed that Jesus was Lord because Jesus was willing to suffer for us. That he believed that Jesus understood, and that gave him faith that Jesus understood what he was going through and gave him his life. So I mulled that over, and over the next year or so, the Holy Spirit used that conversation, and this is where the pain to Chuck comes in, because we had to try going to a bunch of different churches. So you ever see those movies where they show the lady tries to date a bunch of different guys, and they're all losers? Like, 
She goes to the restaurant, she's sitting across from the guy and the guy says something bizarre and then they show the next scene. She's sitting across from the next guy, like he's rich, but it turns out he's a serial killer. So <laughs> we, go, we go to the Catholic church, we go to more than one Baptist church, we go to Episcopalian church, we, there were great pancakes there. <laughs> We um, went back to my Lutheran church, but it's like no one cared that my grandmother helped found, found it. They're like, hey. <laughs> that's my picture in the confirmation class. They're like, okay, that's nice. Um, we tried uh, the Methodist church out in Mandarin, and that's the one where I ran out crying and couldn't sit through the service because I was so frustrated because I still couldn't believe the way I felt like I wanted to believe. So then one day we decided to try the church that was closest to our house, which was a Presbyterian church. Chuck was Methodist, I was Lutheran, why not? <laughs> South Jacksonville Presbyterian Church, it's up there in San Marco. And we went there and um, that was that. We were invited to Sunday school. I still wasn't there yet. Um, the minister preached about a lot about the suffering God. The suffer God suffers with us. God is with us when we are sad. God brings us peace. God knows what you're going through. And when we joined the church a year later, and I made my profession of faith again, my affirmation, reaffirmation, it was with an absolutely clear a vision and belief that God had come to get me Jesus had come through closed doors, that Jesus had presented himself to me with his wounds, and that by his wounds, I was healed. So as you know, if you um, have had a faith journey, and you all have, you're somewhere in, in that faith journey, and it's not linear, there's no moment that it's just, you're stuck in that time. You're always growing. You're always deepening, or God is deepening for you, your foundation in trusting God's love and, and have the kind of proof that God gives is not really the kind of proof you have in a court of law. But it's like the spirit working through, through worship, through study, through things that a friend may say, like my uh, senior partner in the airplane on the way back from Pensacola. God will continue to have you trust and grow. And then our responsibility is to prove, help God, God doesn't need any help, participate in proving God's love to others. And that's what some of the other messages will be about is how we are then chosen through our actions to prove God's love in Jesus Christ by being Christ-like. Thank you for letting me tell my story today. It's amazing that from that day um, when we joined the church in 1984 to now I get to stand in front of you and share my faith. And I ask that God bring um, glory to my humble words. Amen.